There used to be a gentleman that would sit by the window of this assisted living center in my neighborhood. And every time I would walk by, he would wave at me with this huge smile on his face. So one day I went in to ask if I could volunteer to facilitate an art program there. They told me no. So I went back again the next day, and again a couple of days after that. And finally, on the third time, they allowed me to facilitate arts and crafts once a week, and I was able to do this for about six months. Sadly, though, the staff there didn't seem to understand why I had wanted to do it in the first place. And even some of the residents asked me why I kept coming in, saying things like, you know, most kids your age don't think twice about a bunch of old people like us. But I guess I was just a weird kid. One of the projects we did there was we cut up a bunch of old t-shirts into strips and tied them together to make a long rope, like an old school kite string. I then weaved the rope around the room by handing each person a piece to hold on to. Except for there was one woman who was not very responsive, so I had just laid a piece in her lap. And then this formed a physical line of connection between everyone in the space. And so when I went to collect the rope from each person, the woman who had not been responsive had now grabbed a hold of the rope. And she wouldn't let go of it. And she was just gently stroking the t-shirt fabric with her thumb. And I remember thinking, getting the impression that this woman needed this piece of t-shirt. And so I untied that piece from the rest of the rope and left it with her. I don't know what she had. The nurses couldn't disclose patient information because I was an undocumented volunteer at the facility. But whatever was going on in her brain, in that moment with the t-shirt, I felt like I could catch a glimpse of her. And so my six months there were relatively short, but the experience was also very rich. And it catalyzed my current trajectory, which combines art with researching cognitive health and aging. Specifically, looking at how art may help prevent cognitive decline associated with dementia. Alzheimer's disease is the fifth leading cause of death in people over age 65 in the US. And our older adult population is expected to double within the next 15 years. So now, more than ever, we have this incredible need to sustain functionality and well-being throughout the lifespan. And we give a lot of attention to the health of our bodies, the number on the scale, our cholesterol, cavities, our heart, lungs. So why not our brains? It's the chief organ in the body that controls how we function and interact with the world. I had a professor in my undergrad who used this analogy of the brain as a bucket. And there are two ways we can look at this bucket. We can look at how full it is. The fullness of the bucket represents how much you know or have learned through education or experience. Or we can look at how big it is. The size of the bucket represents our maximum capacity. The bigger it is, the greater our potential for learning. In scientific literature, the term for bucket size is cognitive reserve. And it can grow or shrink depending on our capability for neuroplasticity. A neuroplasticity describes how neurons can adapt to their environment, how they can change and rewire. So every time you learn or do something new, cortical neurons in your brain change. And studies have shown that more plastic brains are better protected against neurodegenerative diseases like dementia. So if you think of your skin, moisturizer helps to lock in elasticity, helps prevent wrinkles, helps your skin bounce back. So much like a sort of cerebral moisturizer, neuroplasticity helps your brain bounce back from decline. But here's the good news. At any age, research has shown us now that you can increase your brain's plastic potential, increasing your bucket size or cognitive reserve, and thereby protecting your mind. But in the same way that your potential can expand, it can also shrink. If you stop learning, your brain will decide that it doesn't need to be so flexible anymore. 
and it stops buying the fancy anti-wrinkle moisturizer serum. So the adage, if you don't use it, you lose it, is true. So imagine we're all 62 years old, the average age of retirement, and are now faced with having to find new ways to stay active. At 62, we're also three years away from the average age of dementia onset. So how can we protect the place that holds our memories and our sense of identity? To keep our brains flexible and cognitive reserve buckets big, we must never stop learning. But I'm not just talking about pumping our buckets full of Snapple facts. There's a difference between filling up your bucket and making it bigger. And when it comes to making your bucket bigger, the best kind of learning is the kind that raises more questions than answers. And it's my idea that art induces this type of learning and may make our buckets bigger. For the artists and the art lovers out there, we know how art affects a person, the observer or the doer. And research tells us that art promotes emotional well-being and quality of life, but it doesn't tell us much about what art does for our cognitive health. And there are a few reasons for this. First, in the research on art and dementia, there's too much variability in terms of how the data was collected, the participants' levels of cognitive functioning, and even how the researchers define the art experience. Some define it as a practice of expression, some as going to a museum, some as a craft or a hobby. And so these inconsistencies make it difficult for us to draw conclusions. Secondly, the growing body of literature on dementia and art therapy generally adopts an expressionist perspective of art that emphasizes emotional release. And so while these studies have shown that art therapy has emotional benefits for people who already have dementia, few have yielded cognitive outcomes. And our third research gap is that while art is looked at as treatment for dementia symptoms, rarely ever has it been looked at as prevention. I know of only one study that has looked specifically at art as a protective factor. And in this study, they found that people who more frequently engaged in craft and art activities were less likely to develop cognitive impairment. And so while these findings are extremely exciting, in this study, craft and art activities were assessed by just two short questions on a survey about other daily life activities. You see, a scientist's understanding of art is incongruent with that of an artist's. But actually, art and science are not so fundamentally different. We tend to separate them because their methods of operation seem to oppose each other. Science attempts to answer questions, while art attempts to ask them but they share a common goal, and that is to bring new thoughts into the world. And so to capture the full picture of how art affects a person, you need more than a couple questions on a survey. And while we could talk about expressivity or cathartic art, it's my idea that we should be talking about something else. There are many working parts to the art process, and the part that may directly affect our cognitive reserve buckets has been overlooked, or is contested as not being the true essence of art. Maybe it's perceived as too rational. Uh, someone once said to me that art is rationalized nonsense. Art can be nonsensical and impulsive, but what makes an artwork interesting is what happens after that moment of compulsion. Does the work reveal nothing more than a whim? Or does the idea within the work stand ground? In the 1960s, an art movement called conceptualism valued the idea as the most important thing about an artwork. Now, this liberated art because an idea is not bound to a physical object and can be expressed in an infinite number of ways. So it's not about talent or craft or aesthetic beauty. What matters is the artist's ability to pose interesting questions and to stimulate discourse. And so, in this way, the essence of art is not located in the viscera or in the subconscious mind. I would argue that it's located in the frontal lobe, where we solve problems 
interpret language, make plans, think critically, and ask questions. Curiosity is power. The search to understand is far more fruitful than one's arrival at understanding. And art allows us to navigate our curiosity and to challenge our deepest rooted perceptions. The creation and existence of art is propelled by inquiry. And this is the crucial mechanism that may help buffer against cognitive decline. But of all the ways that researchers have looked at the art experience, none have looked at art as a form of critical thinking and problem solving, and how this affects brain plasticity, and how it may relate to dementia risk. So I'm leading a new research project. It's funded by a local arts council. And our aim is to find out whether an art-based cognitive health program for seniors in the community can help reduce their risk of dementia. But the program is unique because it's not an art class where one learns technique or how to use different art mediums. Instead, they're learning how ideas are communicated and interpreted, how neuroplasticity works in the brain, and methods for viewing, thinking about, and interacting with the world in innovative ways. So I'll give you a brief example. Along with some of the projects we do, I give my participants mini brain exercises. And one of the exercises was to select any common object, describe it, and then rename it in a way that gives a new thought to that object. One of my participants picked hands as one of her objects, and she renamed them choice. Her reasoning was that hands can be used to do good or evil. You just have to choose. So in this process, we've all now literally made a new connection in our brains between these two concepts, hands and choice. We've all just experienced a small dose of neuroplasticity. So it's a 12-week program, and we're using measures of cognitive performance, self-report surveys, and open-ended interview questions to allow us to capture the full picture of how the program is working and whether participants experience cognitive changes over the 12 weeks. But my overall goal for the program is that it will regenerate participants' minds with curiosity. Teaching the process of art as one that is question-based and encouraging them to keep learning and to ask questions. Because continual learning is what maintains our capability for neuroplasticity and protects our brains from functional decline. I'm also a ceramics teacher, and when I encourage people to come to my class, I've often heard the response, well, I'm not really an artist, I'm not creative. It can be a heavy burden to be creative and to feel that pressure to perform. But actually, creativity happens simply when you have curiosity and act on it. And it's not such a burden to be curious. We have that in us since infancy. So if we can spread that message, cultivating curiosity and a desire to question our perceptions and to use critical thinking, then maybe the use of art in treatment or the scientific study of art or the scope of what it means to use art or to do art can have an impact beyond what we could possibly conceive. Because it's never too late or too early to expand your potential. So get curious, question everything, and make your buckets bigger. Thank you.